Hello and welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. Today's date is the 4th of June 2014. Welcome to all listeners. Uh, thanks for listening to Truth Sentinel. We do appreciate you taking the time out to listen to us. I'm currently in London and UK at the moment, but we'll be on the move again to Odessa, Ukraine soon, probably next week, just to see what's going on there. Um, today's news, a terrorism trial could be heard entirely in secret for the first time in an English court. Just another example of how things are changing. So we're going to have secret trials now. You know, um, things have changed over the last 10 years, basically. You can be detained without trial. Uh, Gu Guantanamo Bay is an example of that. And we also reported that there's obviously secret detainees at um, Diego Garcia, which was focused on due to MH370 missing plane. Senior judges have been hearing that the Crown Prosecution Service in the UK wants the criminal case to be dealt with completely behind closed doors on grounds of national security. Again, this use of national security and terrorism. And it seems like whenever you mention uh, national security and terrorism, it means you can do whatever you like. Um, and they've, also, they've already proved that um, they're not actually sticking to the agreement because they detained uh, Glenn Greenwald's partner. Um, at Heathrow Airport under terrorism laws when he's clearly not a terrorist. Okay, other news. Top-ranking US military officer has raised the possibility of Sergeant Bo Bugdal being prosecuted if he abandoned his post before his capture. Um, this is the guy that uh, was released on Saturday after five years in Taliban captivity. Uh, Alex Jones pointed out that um, it's surprising that this guy managed to stay for five years without being harmed as he was being held by particularly violent captors, suggesting that perhaps he'd switch sides a bit like that TV program, Homeland. Barack Obama defended his decision to free uh, five senior Taliban leaders to secure the release of Sergeant Bergdahl. Barack Obama has also condemned Russian aggression in Ukraine, saying it was a uh, dark using dark um, tactics, basically. Um, he said, how can we allow the dark tactics of the 20th century to define the 21st? It's just quite strange when he says stuff like that, when, you know, he's obviously involved in allowing the NSA spying to go on and on, on the whole population of the world, basically. So, uh, you know, he's one to talk about dark tactics. Basically, Obama met uh, President Petro Poroshenko of Russian chocolate fame, and uh, pledged support for him and uh, offered uh, five million dollars of military assistance to Kiev. I mean, it's obviously they're gearing up again for a war. I'm going to Ukraine in next uh, next week, um, hoping that things will be safe there at least. Um, obviously, not safe in the eastern Ukraine. I'm going to be more in sort of south um, Ukraine. Obama has also pledged. Night goggles, food, clothes, rations, radios and other equipment. And Obama's now in Brussels for a meeting of the G7 industrial nations. Uh, obviously the G8 has changed now as Russia's been removed. Today's episode is mostly about protests, unrest and uprisings. And um, police in Nigeria's capital have banned all protests planned in support of the more than 200 girls kidnapped in April. Um, other protests, Indian police have fired water cannons to disperse hundreds of protesters in Uttar Pradesh, where two, te two teenage cousins were gang raped and hanged. Protesters, many of whom were women, were demonstrating outside the office of State Chief Minister Akhilesh Yadev. Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan called CNN correspondent Ivan Watson an agent working for uh, foreign governments. Istanbul police uh, had interrupted a live CNN broadcast on Saturday and ha briefly held Watson, uh, who's been a Istanbul correspondent for some time. He was reporting on the first anniversary of Turkey's biggest anti-government protests in decades at the Gezi Park area. And we'll be going to Antony later on in today's broadcast. This week's news, riot police were on standby as tens of thousands took to the streets in Madrid, Barcelona and other cities across Spain on Monday to demand a vote on whether to rid Spain of its royal family. Yeah, I wonder if we could do that here as well. This comes after Spain's King Juan Carlos um, has said that he's going to abdicate and um, 
promoting his son Philippe as the new king Prince Philippe and would presumably take the title King Philippe the fourth far left parties have called for a national referendum to abolish Spain's monarchy Sudanese authorities are to free a woman who was sentenced to death for having abandoned the Islamic faith which is um, uh, punishable by death in most Islamic traditions if you decide later on you don't want to be a Muslim, uh, you can be executed. And this has been condemned by um, some other world leaders, including the UK's Prime Minister Cameron. Police at Heathrow Airport arrested a 19-year-old man suspected of terror offences. He was detained by counter-terror SO15 officers on suspicion of preparing for acts of terrorism. And they said it was Syria related. I wonder whether he was one of the rebels because that would be a bit strange because they were, our government was actively supporting the rebels up until a few months ago at least. Um, pl police can now just arrest people and say it's because of terrorism. Uh, even in this case they've admitted this is not in response to any immediate risk or threat. I would have thought that was the point of these terrorism laws, it, some immediate uh, risk or threat. Also this week a Bilderberg uh, meeting occurred in Copenhagen, Denmark. It's been a year since the last one, which is in Watford, England, which I attended. I met uh, some interesting people there, Alex Jones and David Icke amongst them. And there was quite a few hundred people there, going into the thousands actually. Um, there was a lot of people not let in. The police stopped people coming in and we were we were held in a field which was in view of where the Bilderberg conference was going on. Uh, it was a great atmosphere and there was lots of speakers. This year apparently there was a lot less people. Um, it was in a more isolated part of um, Copenhagen. Copenhagen in Denmark and just less people were able to make it there. But I know that Alex Jones and um, David Icke were also reporting on that, that uh, conference there. Who are the Bilderberg Group? Uh, according to their website, founded in 1954, it's an annual conference designed to foster dialogue between Europe and North America. About um, 100 to 150 political leaders and experts from industry, finance, academia and the media are invited to take part in the conference. So funny it says media there because um, you very rarely get any reports from inside so but it must be maybe maybe they mean editors of newspapers who they control anyway. It's supposed to be for informal discussions and no policies made there although the, um, the idea of them all meeting together and it not actually influencing policy when they say that it's the very rare occasion when they can actually all express their views. I think the idea that there's no policy made, maybe they don't sign it inside the conference, but I'm sure it does affect policy. Anyway, my problem with it is it shouldn't be secret, you know. If there's nothing to hide, as they say to us, then tell us what's going on. Um, and I think part of the problem is also that we just generally just don't like these people. So when they start meeting in secret, we it really riles us, you know. Um, I think that's the root cause. We don't like these people anyway, so we don't like them meeting in secret. A deal has been reached on the release of the gist of the Blair Bush Iraq talks. This is an absolute joke. Details of the gist talks between Tony Blair and George Bush before the Iraq war are to be published, the UK's Chilcot inquiry says. But transcripts and full notes of conversations will remain secret at the request of the government. Just about everything's secret these days if it's likely to be of any importance. Basically, they're going to release um, some of the details of the conversations, but they're going to delete anything that could be an, a violation of national security or in, um, impair relations between the two countries. So you're just going to have a complete whitewashed conversation. Okay, a roundup of last episodes. Last episode we had a debate about religion. A uh, two hour episode, over two hours, we were talking about atheism and Christianity in particular. But also we touched on Islam and Buddhism. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that, it's quite an interesting episode. It makes you think about the, uh, the meaning of life and uh, why we're here and um, I think it's good to examine uh, your beliefs and have a th sit down sometimes and think about what this is all about. Sometimes I, I stop and think, you know, what is all this about? And it just, it blows my mind that we're, we're part of whatever this is, this game that we, that we seem to be living in. It's almost like a computer game. Uh, remember to please leave comments in the comments section if you've got any, um, anything you'd like us to talk about. We're always open to ideas. Remember, this is your channel just as much as it is ours. Um, we invite guests uh, on who are listeners. Um, we had Michael on uh, on the last episode. So if you feel like you could talk about something, 
you're knowledgeable about a certain subject, please get in touch. ScottSentinel9 at gmail.com. Today I wanted to spend a little bit of time with you myself and, and talk about um, the theme of today's episode, which is protests, uprising, unrests. I think it was exactly, I know, it was exactly 25 years ago yesterday when more than a million Chinese students and workers occupied Beijing's Tiananmen Square. And the protests there, who knows what they've achieved? I mean, there's still obviously a lot of censorship and uh, control in China. But there's been so many uprisings and protests in the last sort of 10, 10, 15 years. Um, we had the Arab Spring, a revolutionary wave of demonstrations and protests, violent and non-violent. Um, in the Arab world, which began in 2010. Um, by 2013, rulers had been forced from power in Tunisia, Egypt, Libya, Yemen, Bahrain, and Syria, although obviously an ongoing situation there. Also Algeria, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, and Sudan. There's protests in Venezuela, uh, in Caracas, which started this year in February. Um, turned deadly when three people were shot by gunmen following a peaceful march that day. There have been many uh, demonstrations since then, varying in size from small gatherings to large rallies. We've had the Maidan um, protests, uprising and revolution in Ukraine. Um, whether that's been successful is a matter of opinion. It doesn't look good at the moment, that's for sure. I think um, maybe some people who are involved in these protests and uprising have the right, the right um, sense of meaning and uh, they mean well but then sometimes other people come along and start infiltrating groups and change the actual outcome of what people are trying to do. In Turkey we have the Gezi Park uh, protests which and we'll be talking to Anthony later about them as they're still continuing. Uh, Thailand, uh, some of which I witnessed the protests there, was I was in Kosan Road which was a few streets away um, from one of one area of protests in Bangkok, I saw thousands of people who closed a road down. There was a really good atmosphere there. It was like a festival. People were selling T-shirts. There was um, barbecue stands. Um, loads of people lying on the roads, uh, sleeping on the roads with sleeping bags. There were musicians. A uh, giant screen with a political leader talking. It was a great atmosphere. Um, it wasn't necessarily reported that way. It was reported that, you know, there, there was obviously a small uh, section of people throwing smoke grenades and that in another part of Bangkok. And that just seems to be the area the media will latch on to. People protesting against the military coup in Thailand now have started using a three-fingered salute, uh, recalling the gesture of defiance in, in the popular film Hunger Games. Uh, this is a sign with three middle fingers are held up. Uh, used as an expression of silent protest against the fictional authoritarian state called Panem in Catching Fire, the second film in the Hunger Games trilogy. Of course, that's been in the news again um, in the last couple of weeks due to the son of the assistant director going on the rampage in California killing half a dozen people. Um, half of those he did with a knife, although people are obviously uh, campaigning for guns to be taken away in the States. I used to be, um, as I mentioned before, I used to be someone who thought, well, you know, why do we need guns? Um, and, there, you know, you can definitely make a case that in a, an ideal society we don't need guns, but we're not living in an ideal society anymore, and um, if there's any time in history when Americans need to keep hold of their guns, it's probably now when you've got governments which are, are just going out of control at the moment. Okay, um, other protests that happened um, in the last 10 years, there was the G8 summit protests in the UK, or rather there wasn't. Why wasn't there? Because the police went in and arrested 57 people in a raid before the protests, despite the fact that it's supposed to be a human right to protest. Well, it's supposed to be part of our laws that we have the right to protest. Not anymore, that's been taken away. Riot police raided the central London headquarters of anti-G8 protesters and hundreds of officers were deployed in the capital as protests took place against the G8 summit that was going to be held the next day. Um, some people tried to actually kill themselves saying they didn't want to be part of a police state and um, the police stop, had to stop one guy from jumping off the roof of the building. Also of course protesters are more and more being classified as extremists and even terrorists in some cases and also the citizens of countries are being criminalized Czechs at airport almost assume that everyone's a terrorist confiscating everything even though they know full well you're not a terrorist that's the point 
Nobody's complaining about people searching people before they get on the plane. We all want to be safe. But when since they um they know that you that basically the stuff they they're taking off you is not dangerous. They're confiscating hundreds and hundreds of thousands of deodorants for, pointlessly in my opinion. I mean, if a terrorist wanted to kill someone or wanted to blow a plane up, then they can get something on board just by confiscating all the deodorant, you're not stopping terrorism that way. It's just a, a ploy to get people used to being searched and controlling people, getting used to taking off their shoes, their belts, etc. It does seem like governments are gearing up for further protests and riots. I mean, the Department of Homeland Security in the USA has purchased 1.4 billion rounds of ammunition during a six month period. 450 million rounds of hollow point bullets, 200 million rounds of rifle ammunition, 176,000 rounds of hollow point boat tail bullets, um, is, which is used as ammo for sniper rifles. Now this seems to ex far exceed the amount which is used in uh, combat. The war in Iraq consumes about 70 million rounds of ammunition each year. So if you put that in perspective, if you compare that, you can see that really is a very large amount of um, ammunition they're buying there for some reason. What are they planning? I mean, people talk about FEMA camps, uh, like internment camps that are being constructed in the USA, um, a bit like concentration camps. It seems like either they're expecting riots and protests or they have something else in mind. Next we're going to go to Antony, our academic research from the University of Bilkent in Turkey, Ankara. And we'll be looking at some of the injustices and the protests uprisings, and particularly focusing on um, Turkey. It's a good test case for us to look at to see what happens when people protest against a government and uh, how far governments will go to suppress people who are trying to change the system. This is the anniversary of um, the previous protests where um, Anthony reported that um, a young boy got shot in the face with a uh, gas canister, tear gas canister. And tear gas seems to be the weapon of choice at the moment. They've also had uh, water cannons, I believe. And it's good for us to focus on this case and just to think what would happen if, they, if there was protests in your country? Um, what would the government reaction uh, be? And so it's good to focus on this case as you have a, a prime minister, a very arrogant prime minister who wants to suppress these people. Let's see what's happening over there at the moment. Hello, Anthony. Hi, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Um, not too bad. You know, it's been a bit of a busy week, but um, and I think Truth Sentinel may be a little bit late this week. But apart from that, everything's fine. Great. How about Great. yourself? Yeah, um, good to be back as usual. It's been an interesting week in Turkey. Yeah, you've had the um, the riots again in the uh, Taksim Square. Is that right? They weren't um, they weren't quite as uh, intense as as I expected, but yeah, they have been um, they have been around. I was I was treated uh, a couple of nights ago to to the very um, disturbing sound of the uh, Islamic call to prayer struggling to be heard over the sound of police helicopters. <laughs> So it must have been um, very noisy. What time of night was that then? That was about 10 p.m. Difficult to sleep if you're in that sort of area, I would have thought. Yeah, I was uh, I was in the centre of Ankara, and uh, basically what was happening was the um, the anniversary of the of the Gezi Park uh, demonstrations, which have become a real uh, rallying point here. I would say. So I, I, I wanted to talk a little bit tonight about Gezi Park, what it is and why it's significant and, uh, and whether we can see any trends in it. Yeah, definitely. I mean, because, you know, there's been sort of uprisings in a lot of countries in the last sort of couple of years, um, in, uh, uh, ranging from riots to uprisings to complete government takeover, like in Ukraine, for example. Yeah, before we do that, do you know anything about what's happening in Thailand? Because uh, I, I just haven't been keeping up with that at all. I, I, I figured maybe you have a little bit. Um, I know that uh, the military uh, stepped in and said and basically took over, uh, conducted a military coup, which they've done before. They, they, I, I've actually been in Thailand before when that's gone on, and 
apart from a couple of tanks, you really wouldn't know anything's happening. And you, <laughs> usually the military step in when they've had a chat with the king. The king often says something like, uh, you know, um, this isn't, you know, this isn't working out because there's been lots of problems over the last sort of six months. And it seems like they've stepped in and taken over, basically. And I think elections are due to occur in about a year's time now. But it's kind of, this is kind of normal for Thailand. It just seems like, um, you know, they, they put someone in power. Um, the people don't like them. Um, they, they, there's an uprising um, and then the military step in and do another military coup. It's a cycle now. It does seem to be, yeah, it's a very tumultuous political process over there. It is. Taxin was ousted before and, and to put his one of his sisters in uh, in power instead doesn't seem to me to be have been a good idea. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Fair enough. Uh, Yingluck, I think her name is. Uh, Yingluck Shinawatra. Uh -huh. uh, Taxin uh -huh. Shinawatra and Yingluck Shinawatra. Apologies to anyone listening if that's uh, pronounced incorrectly. <laughs> there were probably tones and all kinds of things that you missed out there. There's probably Thais uh, listening and just sighing in dismay, uh, <laughs> I just said. Okay, so, um, yeah, so as I said, I wanted to talk about uh, Gezi Park. Um, I don't know if this is a famous phrase uh, internationally or not, uh, but here uh, it's very much, yeah, you very much talk about the, the, the Gezi Park riots. Yeah. And basically, uh, what happened was that last May, uh, a large group of people occupied uh, Taksim Square in Istanbul. If you've yeah. been to if you've been to Istanbul, uh, and if you uh, if you've been across the river from the old center, where the Grand Bazaar is and the Blue Mosque and so on, then you've probably seen uh, Taksim. It's it's a huge open area. Um, I mean, really huge. It can accommodate tens of thousands of people. And it's at uh, the end of a long avenue called uh, Istiklal Jadisi or, or Independence Avenue. So so the initial protest was a sit-in uh, to, to contest an, a, a development plan. The, um, the government basically wanted to put a bridge through Gezi Park, which is adjacent to Taksim. And that would have meant basically destroying much of the park. But um, the participants in the sit-in were objecting to that because Gezi is part of, you know, the lungs of Istanbul. Now, uh, Gezi has uh, been compared to the Occupy movement uh, because part of that was also essentially a very large-scale sit-in. Yeah, but personally, uh, I, I think it has uh, things in common with a number of protests. And uh, I, I wanted to mention or well, sorry, I should say protest movements. And I wanted to mention one in particular, which is the uh, S21 protests. These, these happened in Germany, in, in Stuttgart, in 2010. Okay, yeah, please um, please let us know. I, I wasn't that familiar with these particular um, protests. So, uh, yeah, what, what happened there? Well, basically, um, there had been a plan uh, on the table for a while to redevelop Stuttgart's uh, central railway station in a way that would destroy one of the city's largest and most beautiful parks. It's kind of the signature green space of the city. And uh, the protests started peacefully and they included a large cross-section of people. I mean, it, it, we're not just talking about you know, radical uni students. It was the middle class, it was grannies, it was even conservative landowners who, who didn't want an ugly development spoiling the views from their mansions, you know. But uh, the Premier of uh, Baden-Württemberg, which is the state of which uh, Stuttgart is the capital, he decided that he was going to use these protests to kind of promote a, a tough guy reputation. Yeah? And he approved a, a police response that was unusually heavy-handed and brutal for, for modern-day Germany. So uh, the police were using pepper spray, water cannon, batons, and there were serious injuries. Uh, one pensioner was blinded. There were lots of hospitalizations. So then peaceful uh, sit-in and a couple of marches turned into serious resistance because it was clearly excessive force on the part of the police. So you had more protests, which were then partly motivated by anger. And then, again, the, the police reaction really 
stepped up. You know, you, you had these amazing scenes where, where police were literally just beating people and dragging them away out of a crowd full of, you know, grandmothers and school kids and so on. It was a really ugly situation. And it, it freaked the Germans out because it, uh, I guess Germany has, uh, I would say, still fairly vivid memories of the 1968 student riots. <clears throat> And the Bader Meinhof gang and all kinds of other stuff uh, that happened in the in the 60s and early 70s, which I think German society thought that it had moved beyond. You know, but but this this really brought back all of those those memories. Those were very violent protests and uh, a real vote of no confidence in the direction that German society was taking at the time. But look, I, I also think that S21 is, is significant because uh, it marked the emergence of uh, a new kind of protest or a new kind of uh, response to protest, which I think is, is becoming disturbingly common. And uh, we see it again in, in Gezi. I mean, <laughs> We've seen quite a few uh, protest movements springing up in a variety of places over the past five years or so. Yeah. And I think these new harsher responses are basically sending a message, which is that peaceful protests against uh, government or, or corporate interests are not okay. And if you engage in them, you're risking your safety. So... <laughs> The official line with these things is always that, you know, there were terrorists or extremists or, or, or whatever inciting the crowd, you know, so that, oh, yes, the vast majority of protesters were peaceful, but then, you know, terrorists or extremists incited them and it turned violent. But but actually, the incitement tends to come from governments. They, they deliberately opt for a police response, which is just way out of proportion and incredibly inappropriate. And, and that stirs things up. So, so then they can uh, demonize the, the, the participants in the protest. You know. and I, I, think, um, I think they can do that fairly easily as well using the, the media. I mean, there was the G8 protests um, some time ago here in London and uh, the police actually went in the day before the protests were due to protest and arrested some of them and basically um, uh, got moved them out of their accommodation. One of them, one of the protesters, was going to jump off a building, saying he didn't want to live in a police state, and they mm. managed managed to stop him. But it was it was un um, it was the first time I've ever heard of anything like that. Arrests being made before protests continued, and I think the the general population they don't care anymore. They just you know when when the police go in and do something that uh, for me for me it's quite serious. It's like what's happened to peaceful protest that was part of the our, our laws before but it just seems like those some of the laws have just dropped and bitten and, and the general population don't seem to care and they'll quite easily buy into um the lies that are put in the media that these are just you know extremists yeah or something like that yeah and yeah i totally agree and and uh you know you mentioned uh, these police turning up before the protests had started which makes me think of uh, something which we mentioned on a previous episode, which was uh, when the 14-year-old boy, Turkish boy, um, Birkin Elvan died. He was a kind of symbol of the protest movement. And uh, his body was, um, was interred in a funeral home in Istanbul. And the police turned up the day before the body turned up. <laughs> With uh, sorry, not the day before the police turned up on the morning. The body was meant to turn up in the afternoon, and they turned up in riot gear with tear gas and water cannon and the, and the whole box and dice before any of the mourners. That's so, very sensitive of them. It certainly is, um, but you know, so so yeah, I think I think this is part of the aim is to is to demonise the participants by stirring trouble. You know, hopefully you can get a bit of footage of somebody throwing a Molotov or lighting something on fire that's or what that, that's what they always do and i think um talking about the media again the bbc are the worst the worst for that kind of thing in when i was in uh, bangkok um it was i saw that hundreds of thousands of people peacefully demonstrating very good party almost party festival kind of atmosphere and mm -hmm. the bbc just stuck one photo of someone sm uh, throwing a smoke grenade you know yeah uh, which they must have found it in a very isolated part of um of the protests. Well, if you can't find that, 
uh, then then the police are not doing their job by by the standards of uh, recent years, you know, <laughs> because these these kinds of actions, these throwing the molotovs and 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 so on, throwing the petrol bombs, smoke bombs, very often with these protests. I mean, certainly with S twenty one in Stuttgart, that's not what the protesters came to do. It's actually a reaction to the police's behaviour, which is calculated. I mean, it, it, there's a precise intention, it seems to me, of uh, making people really really angry by putting them and, and the others around them in danger, you know. Um, so I think that these two protests, S21 and Gezi Park, are unfortunately part of a, a, a pattern. We can see a lot of parallels between them and elsewhere as well. And the other parallel is that ultimately these are confrontations between uh, police and citizens over projects which will benefit either private interests or the more general goal of progress, as governments like to define it. Yeah. So, so in the case of, of S21, this, this new railway station, station development was, uh, it was meant to facilitate a high-speed rail link between Paris and Bratislava, which is obviously, you know, 20, 21st century progress. So Angela Merkel was, was not thrilled that the people of Stuttgart might uh, value their green space more than her exciting railway project <laughs> and and you know she got behind this the, the state premier in supporting this this fierce police response and the result was scenes that you know we we really couldn't have imagined in germany just just a few years before that uh but it, getting back to Gezi Park, it was a it was a similar kind of thing. You, you know, you had a peaceful sit-in starting on the twenty eighth of May last year, uh, and that was broken up violently by the police. And then you had the PM announcing that uh, I'll quote him here: "Whatever you do, we've made our decision, and we will implement it." And that, coupled with the the police violence, uh, just set off a wave of of protest of a different kind that wouldn't have occurred at all if the authorities had you know gone about things in a, in a smarter and more patient and more moderate kind of way um, but of course here in Turkey you've, you've got a man in charge who who I mean he's just grown and grown you know in terms of his his arrogance I suppose uh, every year he's been in power uh, Erdogan is is only in power for one reason which is that the, the the opposition parties can't they they can't sort out their their you know small differences and they can't field a decent candidate if they manage to do either or or both of, the, of those things then the combined support from the electorate would just blow Erdogan off the world stage permanently. Do you, do you happen to know how long he he stays in power? He's been there since two thousand and two. Um, so do, do they don't have a time limit as to how long they can stay in power. I, no, I don't believe there's a limit on the number of terms that a prime minister can serve. I think because he's, you see, this is a presidential uh, uh, democracy, um, and I believe there is a limit on the number of terms that the president can serve, but not the prime minister. I, I, I correct me, listeners, if I'm wrong about that, but that seems that that's my perception of it. Um, but you know, obviously, um, he he chooses to ignore these these facts. And, and he pretends that he's got this you know, mandate from the people, which actually seems like kind of an illusion, you know, like, like with a lot of political leaders. I mean, in Australia, you know, the conservative government uh, rules the electorate most of the time, but almost never with an absolute majority of the, of the votes. And, and it's become almost a tradition for conservative prime ministers to claim that they have a mandate from the people when, in fact, more people voted against them than for them. I believe that I believe that's quite similar in the UK as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not an expert on um, how it all works, but um, I mean, I just know that nothing much ever changes. That's all I know from my point of view. But yeah. I, I do know that we've got a, like a first past the post system, and that quite often they count up the votes, and, and it's not the person who's got the <laughs> the most votes that seems to win. It's all it's all a bit strange for me. Yeah, and of course, you know, in the US, geez, mm, don't even start talking about that system. But anyway. <laughs> Um, on, on June the 1st last year, so three days after the, uh, the sit-in had started, um, and uh, they'd broken it up and, and sent the people away, the, the, the police then retreated from Taksim Square, 
And then the protesters retook it, and they they set up a camp there, which I, I guess is where the the Occupy comparisons come from. Yeah, though of course the same thing happened with S twenty one, and also more recently with with Ukraine and the Maidan. Yeah, uh, and so these these demonstrations started then morphing into something different. Again, like the Maidan, they started as a comment on on something very specific, this this stupid bridge project in Turkey's case. But uh, more and more, they, they just became protests against the arrogance of the government you know, and the direction that it's been trying to take Turkey in over the past few years. You know. um, very, very broadly, that direction is uh, away from the secular democracy, which was set up by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk in the 1920s, and more towards being an authoritarian Islamic republic, we could say, but a fake one. I mean to say that uh, much in the same way that the Republican Party started to court the Christian right vote in the USA in the 90s, uh, the AKP, the ruling party here, Erdogan's party, court the religious right here because they know that it keeps them in power, much more so than because they believe what they're saying. They, they seem to be fake Muslims, fake, sorry, I should say, fake authoritarian Islamicists. <laughs> um, it's, it's very, very cynical and it's, it's very, very disturbing. Do you, um, think, um, do you think there's any chance that you could get a Maidan situation in uh, Turkey there? We have had it, but it's not, um, uh, we've had something very like it, but the, the, the government here is, has a much firmer control over the country. I think that uh, Yanukovych never really had the apparatus behind him that, that Turkey has. You've got to remember there's a, there's a saying, every Turk is a soldier. The army here is huge. So as long as uh, you keep them on side, you're fine. In fact, there's really only two ways it can go. If it comes down to a showdown between uh, the people and the government, it's going to go uh, suppression or it's going to go military coup. I wonder how Sorry. they. Um, I wonder how they keep the soldiers on their side. Then, I mean, are they fairly well paid in Turkey? Do you know? This I do not know. Because <laughs> I just wondered if you know, like like you say, like um, if if the army's so huge, and that's one of the reasons that um, would prevent an uprising of you know on, yeah. a, on large scale. Like, how are they keeping all the soldiers on their side when you've got such an arrogant leader like that? I don't know, but um, there was a military coup here in the 1980s, and uh, some very bloody scenes ensued. Uh, you know, um, executions of people who who uh, were not supporting the coup, and so on and so on. Um, so it has happened. I believe that was not the first one either. So yeah. But anyway, so the the protests, uh, as I said, they evolved into this kind of no no confidence vote against the government. Naturally, the government responded by cracking down, as they like to say in the media. Uh, and then finally, on the, on the 15th of June last year, they managed to clear Taksim Square again, which seemed like a victory, but actually it, it set something quite interesting in motion because the demonstrators, not having their Taksim Square to go to anymore, they started meeting in other places and the movement spread around the country and it grew then to just an incredible size. At one point, uh, the estimates are that there were about 5,000 different protest locations. Imagine 5,000 Maidans, right, on a larger or smaller scale, like we had in Ukraine with the, you know, the Alto Maidan and the regional Maidans, those, those kinds of things, 5,000 of them. And a total of about three and a half million protesters, which is just, I mean, that's, that's three and a half times bigger than the London protest against the invasion of Iraq. So huge. Mm. But uh, of course, you know, in Erdogan's speeches, these people were just, again, I'll quote him, just a few looters. <laughs> that, that's, that's, those were his words. But you know, the upshot of this, unfortunately, was basically uh, bloodshed. The, the, the police force turned against its own people in the most brutal way. You ended up with something like 15 fatalities, d depending on which source you get your numbers from, and about 8,000 citizens injured by police, which is just astonishing, really. You know, you had the water cannon going, which can do some serious harm. It can, you had, it can blind people with the water cannon. <coughs> it can, and <coughs> a few days ago, uh, 
on Taksim Square, there was a small protest. Uh, police brought out the water cannons and they shattered the glass on a, a street vendor's stall and the glass just flew everywhere. One person ended up in hospital. So water cannon are not fun. Uh, rubber bullets, tear gas canisters. And uh, in some cases, the police, uh, the, the police here developed this exciting technique last year of firing tear gas canisters directly at individuals at point blank range. So it, it turned into, uh, I would say, I think you could say a fairly disgraceful episode in, in, in the country's history. Yeah. Mm. And what, one thing I wanted to say is like in case uh, there was any sort of American listeners um, listening thinking what, what's this got to do with us? Well, I think I think um, these kind of things are, are good sort of experiments for us to see, you know, what, what could possibly occur in our own our own countries. I mean, now now in the USA, um, apparently the Department of Agriculture has just been stocking up on thousands of uh, hundreds of thousands of rounds of ammunition and other other government departments are as well everyone's wondering what's going on because they you know all these government departments are ordering ordering uh, millions of rounds of ammunition and um, you know there's talk of FEMA camps being set up and it's uh, you know a lot of people are wondering what kind of what what are the government expecting to happen over there because it seems like they're gearing up for mass insurrection or or takeover Either from um, you know insurrection from the the people towards the government, or or direct uh, directly from the government towards the people. I think it would be incredibly frustrating to be an, an American and uh, and a person who doesn't have faith in their government, because the government has such overwhelming power in the USA. It must seem like an insurmountable force there. Yeah. Well, I, I must I must say in in the UK I feel like that as well. I feel like despite people moaning and grumbling sometimes there's still a large percentage of people in the uk would view the government as looking after their interests uh -huh. which i don't think is the case really no, but not only that if you decided and and if the majority of the people or, or a sizable portion of the people were with you that you were going to take on the government uh which is something which uh, i believe uh americans are are allowed to do under certain circumstances. In fact, I believe that is the origin of the right to bear arms. That if the government essentially hijacks the course of the the uh, country's development in a way which doesn't express the will of the people, then and or uh, threatens to uh, enslave the people, whatever, oppress the people, then then the people themselves have a right and I believe even a responsibility to do something about that. But nowadays. I can't imagine in a country that spends, you know, more on the on, on on military hardware than the next twenty countries behind them put together. <laughs> I, I I just it, it must it must just feel like an overwhelming task, you know. Um, I don't know, but anyway, and yeah. Sorry, been, um, I was going to mention drones as well. There seems to be um, quite a number of governments that are starting to bring in drone technology, and we've got our first drones flying over the UK. Well, I'll say drone because. Um, I've only got one recorded um, evidence on in the media that um, being reported on one military drone flying over the UK. But in the US, I think Obama recently uh, mentioned that they were going to be bringing drones in over there as well. And, so um, I... and apparently uh, it, during the last Champions League football final, there was drones um, going overhead the stadium there as well. So far in Australia, the, the only drones that have been spotted are uh, actually inside Parliament House. <laughs> but, uh, but did you see the story uh, about the drones in India, the drone pizza delivery? <laughs> I did, yeah. And I, and I just thought, well, you know, if I see a pizza flying over my house and I'm particularly hungry, then um, I, I don't think it's going to be too long before either computer hackers are going to redirect those pizzas or uh, <laughs> someone's just going to shoot them down, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a. I, I mean, it's a brilliant story. I, I would almost uh, count it as a as a, a, a form of uh, satirical comment. You know. One thing I've noticed about the drones, though, and, and call me um, paranoid or conspiratorial, but um, you're you're uh, you're quite paranoid, Scott, and a little uh, bit yeah, conspiratorial. Yeah, later. I meant I meant later. Um, <laughs> the, um, basically, we we me and my friends have been noticing that there's been a lot of stories being released about drones. And almost turn them into cuddly little cuddly toys that uh, we're not to be afraid of, you know. Really? Like, well, yeah. Like, um, there was a, I think a um, Valentine drone story about, you know, 
I, I'm not exactly sure what it was about, but it was basically sort of linking romance and drones together. And there's the pizza drones. Uh-huh. Like, don't don't be worried about drones. They can deliver pizzas. Then there was the Amazon Amazon drone, and they can deliver all our products. So it's almost like they're trying to. It seems like they're trying to get people used to the idea of drones as being friendly little things that will help you with your pizzas and shopping. And uh, even with a bit of romance as well, Valentine's Day drones. And, uh, so we're going we're gonna to see them start helping old ladies across the street. Pretty exactly, soon. exactly. And then when the serious ones come along with their guns and start shooting everyone, people will be like, what? I thought they were friendly, you know. Uh-huh. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine a, a kind of Hello Kitty style, you know, like drone backpack and drone drone exactly. t-shirts i was i was uh talking about all this gezi park stuff because uh it's been a year yesterday was uh, sorry two days ago was the the anniversary and in, in the in the year that's elapsed in between i mean we, we've talked about some of the stuff that's happened yeah we've talked about uh the death of the 14 year old birkin elvan yep. uh we talked about um the false flag operation that was planned in syria the uh, attacks on social media and so on. And two things we haven't mentioned. One, just a just a detail, but I think it, it it's a really nasty one, which deserves to be well known. Uh, one of the government's cruelest moves here, I would say, which is that they they enacted a law earlier this year, which said that uh, if a doctor or another medical professional was caught giving medical treatment to a wounded protester, the doctor could be arrested and prosecuted. That was a real masterpiece, I think. Mm, that's very nice, isn't it? Yeah. And the other thing that we didn't talk about was how uh, Erdogan's government, not not uniquely, has has used uh, the popularity of conspiracy theories, yeah, you know, to get their own conspiracies up and running, and 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 try to use those to influence uh, public opinion in in their favor now this is an, another really disturbing trend of course and it's a tactic that uh vladimir putin's particularly fond of you may have noticed um we've seen how well it works in eastern ukraine and the, so for example uh a few days ago <laughs> there was a woman uh burying her husband in donetsk uh, um, after the government there retook donetsk airport from uh well from Primarily a bunch of foreign mercenaries, you know, <laughs> and uh, the 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 group of people who took Donetsk airport on Monday were basically foreign mercenaries and and proponents of this idea of Greater Russia, which includes uh, trying to absorb some Ukrainian territory, you know, in, in in much the same way that Hitler tried to absorb Czechoslovakia and Poland. Yeah. These guys, uh, that's that's their deal. This 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 Nova Russia, the the Greater the Greater Russia. So the government uh, took the airport back. And this woman's husband was there fighting with these uh, these expansionist uh, neo-Nazi nutjobs who are masquerading as freedom fighters fighting against the fascists. And uh, he took a bullet from the Ukrainian military. But uh, her comment, his wife's comment to the media was that he'd been shot by, and I quote, an American sniper. Now, we know... What the information climate is like in Ukraine. Um, um, any piece of, you know, completely unsubstantiated bullshit becomes fact within days, maybe even hours. Yeah, if the story suits the worldview of the people who are rela- who are, you know, relaying the story. So, and we also know that Russians have been told for decades about this threat of being surrounded, you know, encircled of the, the, the various international plots to bring their country down. It's on the history syllabus at St. Petersburg University, you know, um, these, these international conspiracies to, to destroy Russia, you know, whether it be by, by Jews or Americans or whatever. And so they, they love a, a conspiracy theory in Russia. So that American sniper story, I have no doubt, is fact by now. That'll, yeah. be, on, that'll be on RT later, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. Um, so the government here are also trying to harness this power of conspiracies. Now, what, what you might call uh, conspiracy theory inversion, yeah, where instead of people calling out governments on their dodgy behavior yeah, and, and, and governments maintaining the usual plausible denial stuff. Yeah. Uh, the politicians themselves are creating the theories 
but the theories are about their people or about each other. So in Turkey's case, there's not so much paranoia about encirclement and foreign influences as there is in Russia. Although, you know, Erdogan does occasionally mention foreign influences in his rants. But uh, what he started to specialize in is, is claiming that the opposition parties are involved in all kinds of conspiracies and also community groups. So you've got him alleging, for example, that the leader of the CHP, the, the liberal opposition, uh, is engineering this mass movement through like a, a network of shadowy cabals, you know, <laughs> and that this this is where Taksim and all this stuff is coming from. Yeah, the, the goal is uh, to bring about a mass movement which will ultimately uh, undermine the unity of Turkey and uh, allow all kinds of horrible stuff to happen. And it's nothing to do with the people's will and it's everything to do with conspiracy. I was trying to turn him into the victim of this, uh, of these people as well, yeah? Yeah. And I mean, as far as anyone can tell, obviously it's 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 all hot air. But but you know, it, it plays well to a, a certain segment of the of the electorate, which is uh, a, a scary thing because again, it, it shows how governments are um, gaining the ability to co-opt this idea of conspiracy and use it to protect them. So he he also, by the way, uh, called the leader of the opposition a, a, a terrorist, which is you know one of our favourite words in this century and uh, claimed that the opposition party were working with terrorists uh, and you know nowadays of course you just throw that word at anyone who who dislikes you and who's prepared to do something about it no matter what that thing is you know. exactly, yeah. just like the the Beijing government does you know every time the Uyghur province and uh, the Uyghur in, in Xinjiang province fights back there uh, the government have conducted a, a long-running campaign to completely fuck them socioeconomically and remove all traces of their ancient culture and so on. And occasionally somebody there gets angry and again throws a Molotov cocktail, sets up, set something on fire and so they're all just terrorists. Yeah. And in the case of uh, uh, Erdogan, he also said the same thing this week about uh, anniversary commemorations. They were being engineered by terrorists whose aim was to undermine the Republic and so on and so on, which is a really vacuous thing to say. But, you know, that, that's the, the standard of, of public discourse these days, as, as we've seen in many cases. Um, so anyway, this, this month uh, there have been more deaths potentially traceable to Gezi Park there was a guy uh, who recently died of cancer. Uh, his name was Mehmet Stiff. Many people here believe that he contracted the cancer. This uh, he contracted the cancer last year when the police uh, shot tear gas directly into his mouth during the Gezi protests in his hometown. Um, and there have been several others. So well, this what happened? What happened when they when they did that? Uh, so his mouth filled up with tear gas and, and uh, he was rushed to hospital. I might imagine it could be poisonous, isn't it? It's certainly not something that you want in your mouth. No. Uh, <laughs> um, there was a woman that had a, a, who had a, a heart attack as a result of intense tear gas inhalation. She died this week. Uh, you've had two protesters killed in Istanbul this week by police. And then... Uh, on Saturday, you had the, the Gezi Park anniversary, which I mentioned before. Big gatherings in Istanbul, here in Ankara, elsewhere around the country. So basically, the government deployed uh, 25,000 police officers and 50 water cannon trucks to tax in, tax in square. Now, that's, that's just an unimaginable number. And they... They laid on a bunch of armored vehicles, helicopters, and, and so on, just, just to prevent a gathering. Yeah. And uh, meanwhile, you, you know, the Prime Minister is as, as uh, cocky as ever on Saturday afternoon. Another quote from him, he says, uh, you will not be able to come to those places like you did last year because the police have taken absolute orders and they will do all. He, he sounds horrible. I mean... Um, you know, for people who don't particularly respect authority, then he's the worst kind of person who's in power at the moment. I, I imagine this kind of the way he's reacting is just going to make people want to uh, rise up even more. Yeah, and when he says the police take absolute orders and they will do all, what what does that 
mean? I, I, I thought that was rather scary. <laughs> so probably intended to be scary. Wasn't yeah, it? I think so. yeah, I think so. I think so. So so you know, on Friday night in Ankara, you had the same kind of thing, just on a slightly smaller scale. You know, I was here in the centre. You had helicopters flying around all evening. You could feel a kind of tickle in your throat, which is what you get from a distance if there's tear gas being deployed. You had the water cannons out. Ah, in, by the way, um, Istanbul is uh, facing severe water shortages this summer because the water levels in the reservoirs that, that supply the city are just catastrophically low this year. And uh, on one of the uh, English-speaking Turkish media websites, there was a great little uh, juxtaposition last week. Um, there was uh, a story about the water shortages, and in the sidebar on the right, of the page, you could click and link to a story about the police uh, using 40 water cannons on protesters. <laughs> mm. So, but anyway, um, I was a couple of kilometers away from one of the flashpoints. I could hear occasional gunshots. Don't know what kind of ordinance it was. But uh, the the protests died down around 11 p.m. You know, this, this organization that, that Erdogan has branded as terrorists they're called uh, Taksim Solidarity. They were on uh, Independence Avenue in Istanbul around 7.30 p.m. saying, no matter what, we'll never move. Um, but, but by about half past 10, most of them had, you know, gone home. <laughs> so uh, what the next chapter is, I have, I have no idea. It seemed like, uh, it, seemed like um, it was going to be huge. It was less huge than, than, than people were anticipating, certainly less huge than the government were anticipating with their, their 25,000 police officers. So w what happens now? I, I just really don't know. Well, um, well, it remains to be seen. And um, anyway, at least we know that we can rely on you to keep us on uh, update on it. I think it's a good. It is good to watch these kind of events to, to see what could happen in our own countries. I mean, I, I think there's a real thin line between uh, peace and then total disorder. I mean, we we saw in London how quickly things can turn around and how quickly they can turn into kind of like a riot kind of uh, zone. Um, I think it could happen anywhere. You know, especially with the current economic climate. I mean, there's predictions this year of, of a possible economic collapse. And if that happens, then um, maybe this is the kind of thing that they're preparing for in America for the uh, for, for when the economy collapses, um, how to deal with the uprisings that are going to occur. Yeah, I even know people in Australia who are saying that they're ready to fight. And, and you know, Australia has for a country that was that was founded on on uh, such fighting ideals, Australia is, is is very very passive these days. For to to start hearing Australian people say that they're you know quote unquote ready to go to war, uh, as I heard one Australian say a few days ago, that's that's quite extreme. That's and, not um, something what, you hear. What kind of things are they unhappy about at the moment? Oh. <laughs> how much? <laughs> if you how could, much if time you could is... summarize in a couple of sentences, I like. As I mentioned before, Australia has been ruled by conservative governments for most of its history, and uh, it seems that each one becomes more extreme than the last. So, you know, they're 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 actually one of their projects seems to be eroding the um, eroding the separation of church and state, which is a really interesting project in this day and age, I must say. Um, you know, and the usual stuff, gutting the education system and health, and so on and so on. It's it's really um, it's it's getting. It's getting beyond the pale there now. Uh, yeah, people losing trust in the government there. People didn't have any trust in the government to begin with, mm. but but didn't realise just how far they were going to go. Um, and it's uh, there was an article uh, in the New York Times uh, about a week ago uh, saying that Tony Abbott, the Prime Minister of Australia, is one of the world's most unpopular prime ministers, most unpopular prime ministers, <laughs> which is. Pretty funny, considering some of the stuff we've just been talking about. So that that will give you an idea of the of the climate there. I, I don't think there's going to be an uprising in Australia. I think Australia is far too settled and comfortable for that. That's, but, that's what uh, I think, actually. I mean, I was just thinking that um, in places like the USA, uh, the UK, it's slightly different um, environment. Um, I don't think there would be it would be easy to have a mass uprising with the support of the, um, most of the population. I think it tends to be younger people, student types, um, 
or a certain type of people, but certainly a minority, and whereas the rest of society seems to be sort of happy in its, in its um, almost like ignorance of what's actually really is going on. Yeah, and I mean, in, in some ways, you know, that, that has been that has been the case in most of the uh, great revolutions in history and most of the um, catastrophically failed revolutions in history. I mean, everything from, you know, Lenin, Lenin's frustration was, was uh, palpable and he wrote, you know, voluminously about, about the fact that the masses could not be, uh, could not be incited to, to rise up in the way that he, he assumed they would and thought they should, you know. So then they had to, um, they being the Bolsheviks, had to assume another, another model. Instead of this, this great popular uprising, uh, they had to have an uprising that was led by the vanguard in the hope that the great mass of the population would eventually wake up and go, oh, yeah, you guys are right. Yeah, it is nice having a nice a, a new system. Um, revolutionaries everywhere have been facing that for a long time. And in fact, uh, some of the most uh, uh, nasty little um, minds of our time uh, let's take uh, as an example um, Ayman al Zawahiri, who was uh, Osama bin Laden's number two, um, had, had exactly the same situation. You know, he, he had believed for decades that uh, the masses would rise up <clears throat> and overthrow the corrupt regimes of uh, various Islamic countries. And uh, when they didn't do so, he decided that he was going to have to resort to more extreme means, which just alienated more and more people until there was only one real course left to them, which is to attack the great Satan. Yeah. So, yeah, this is not a new thing. Uh, by the way, Scott, um, uh, I just wanted to say one thing about uh, something that was mentioned earlier. In, in the part of our interview about Ukraine, uh, I mentioned that the people who had taken uh, Donetsk airport were neo-Nazis. <laughs> uh, thinking about that as we've been talking, I, I realized that it was a bit of a rash thing to say uh, in the sense that I don't want to brand everybody in the People's Republic of Donetsk as a neo-Nazi because that's certainly not the case. Uh, I, I only meant to say that uh, some of the people involved in that particular action have concrete links to the far right wing uh, in Russia, and that uh, their capture of the airport was a response to um, the new president's uh, expressed wish to come and negotiate in Donetsk. And these guys, this particular group of guys, are not at all interested in negotiation. And that's what brought about the action of taking the airport. Uh, which then led to the government taking it back and all of the casualties. But a lot of people involved, in, even in that action, I would say, were were local residents who just believe that they're fighting for their homeland or whatever. But I, I would maintain that, that, that quite a few of the people who are orchestrating this are people with, uh, with, with, with far-right credentials who are playing a double game there and are very much playing the Eastern Ukrainians off against the Western Ukrainians. So, so those are the people I was referring to earlier, certainly not the entire <laughs> republic or, or even the entire fighting force. No, no, fair enough. Talking of Ukraine, hopefully uh, Truth Sentinel will be doing another report from inside Ukraine in the next few weeks, hopefully. Mm -hmm. You're headed back there? Maybe, maybe. It's not 100% not certain, but certainly looks like it. Okay. Uh, just to see what the mood is again over there, and, um... and to take advantage of the cheap, strong liquor. <laughs> oh damn it! You've sussed me out straight away. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you for coming on the uh, on the show today, uh, Anthony. It's been uh, a pleasure as always. Keep us up to date with what's going on. Hope to speak to you again soon. Yeah, yeah, you too. And I and I'm I'm looking forward to um, hearing your reports from Ukraine. Okay, thank you. No problem, Scott. Talk to you soon. Okay, speak to you soon. Bye. So let me know what you think about protest. Is it the way to go? Um, have you ever taken part in protests? Do you think violent protest is the only answer or are you an advocate of peaceful protest? Personally, I think we can achieve a lot just by getting information out and fighting against the mainstream media 
um, and investigating more, asking more questions in the mainstream media and getting people to start to realize that we're not being presented with the truth by our governments by the, and by the media. And so, as Alex Jones says, there is a war on for people's minds and um, we can fight in that kind of war. Um, I think we can uh, engage in peaceful protests as well, although how long they're going to remain peaceful. Um, in a lot of cases, um, violence seems to occur, whether it be through people who have decided to join the, the protest uh, just because they like to attack people. Anyway, um, thanks for listening today. We're always grateful. Um, remember, the greatest enemy of truth is blind belief in authority, uh, as said by Albert Einstein. Finally, a black bear has been caught on camera lying down in a hammock in the US state of Florida. Homeowner Vincent James said the animal climbed in and laid back like it was a tourist. Something scared him, but then about half an hour he came back and there he was back in the hammock again, taking it easy. And I think we need to take it easy sometimes as well, despite the fact there's lots of unrest and protests and injustice in the world. We have to take time out and just realize that there's some good things going on too. And there's, there's always nature to enjoy and we can always relax like that bear did. Hope you have a fantastic week, everyone. Thanks for listening. Uh, catch you later. Goodbye. Bilderberg Group, uh, according to their website, founded in 1954, it's an annual conference designed to foster dialogue between Europe and North America. About um, 100 to 150 political leaders and experts from industry, finance, academia and the media are invited to take part in the conference. So funny it says media there because um, you very rarely get any reports from inside. So it must be maybe maybe they mean editors of newspapers who they control anyway. It's supposed to be for informal discussions and no policies made there, although the, um, the idea of them all meeting together and it not actually influencing policy when they say that it's the very rare occasion when they can actually all express their views. I think the idea that there's no policy made, maybe they don't sign it inside the conference, but I'm sure it does affect policy. Anyway, my problem with it is it shouldn't be secret, you know. If there's nothing to hide, as they say to us, then tell us what's going on. Um, and I think part of the problem is also that we just generally just don't like these people. So when they start meeting in secret, we it really riles us, you know. Um, I think that's the root cause. We don't like these people anyway, so we don't like them meeting in secret. A deal has been reached on the release of the gist of the Blair Bush Iraq talks. This is an absolute joke. Details of the gist talks between Tony Blair and George Bush before the Iraq war are to be published, the UK's Chilcot inquiry says. But transcripts and full notes of conversations will remain secret at the request of the government. Just about everything's secret these days if it's likely to be of any importance. Basically, they're going to release um, some of the details of the conversations, but they're going to delete anything that could be an, a violation of national security or in, um, impair relations between the two countries. So you're just going to have a complete whitewashed conversation. Okay, a roundup of last episodes. Last episode we had a debate about religion. A uh, two hour episode, over two hours, we were talking about atheism and Christianity in particular. But also we touched on Islam and Buddhism. If you haven't had a chance to listen to that, it's quite an interesting episode. It makes you think about the, uh, the meaning of life and uh, why we're here and um, I think it's good to examine uh, your beliefs and have a th sit down sometimes and think about what this is all about. Sometimes Hello, welcome to Truth Sentinel, watching over the truth in the news. Today's date is the 4th of June 2014. Welcome to all listeners. Uh, thanks for listening to Truth Sentinel. We do appreciate you taking the time out to listen to us. I'm currently in London and UK at the moment, but we'll be on the move again to Odessa, Ukraine soon, probably next week, just to see what's going on there. Um, today's news, a terrorism trial could be heard entirely in secret for the first time in an English court. Just another example of how things are changing. So we're going to have secret trials now. 
you know um, things have changed over the last 10 years basically you can be detained without trial uh, Gu Guantanamo Bay is an example of that and we also reported that there's obviously secret detainees at um, Diego Garcia which was focused on due to MH370 missing plane senior judges have been hearing that the Crown Prosecution Service in the UK wants the criminal case to be dealt with completely behind closed doors on grounds of national security again this use of national security and terrorism and it seems like whenever you mention uh, national security and terrorism it means you can do whatever you like um, and they've also they've already proved that um, they're not actually sticking to the agreement because they detained uh, Glenn Greenwald's partner um, at Heathrow Airport under terrorism laws when he's clearly not a terrorist okay other news Top-ranking U.S. military officer has raised the possibility of Sergeant Bo Bogdal being prosecuted if he abandoned his post before his capture. Um, this is the guy that uh, was released on Saturday after five years in Taliban captivity. Uh, Alex Jones pointed out that um, it's surprising that this guy managed to stay for five years without being harmed as he was being held by particularly violent captors suggesting that perhaps he'd switch sides a bit like that Sometimes I, I stop and think you know what is all this about and it just it blows my mind that we're we're part of whatever this is this game that we that we seem to be living in it's almost like a computer game I uh, remember to please leave comments in the comments section if you've got any um, anything you'd like us to talk about we're always open to ideas remember this is your channel just as much as it is ours um, we invite guests uh, on who are listeners um, we had Michael on uh, on the last episode so if you feel like you could talk about something you're knowledgeable about a certain subject please get in touch scottsentinel9 at gmail.com today I wanted to spend a little bit of time with you myself and, and talk about um, the theme of today's episode which is protests uprising unrests I think it was exactly I know it was exactly 25 years ago yesterday when more than a million Chinese students and workers occupied Beijing's Tiananmen Square and the protests there who knows what they've achieved I mean there's still obviously a lot of censorship and uh, control in China but there's been so many uprisings and protests in the last sort of 10 10 15 years um, we had the Arab Spring a revolutionary wave of demonstrations and protests violent and non-violent um, in the Arab world which began in 2010 and um, by 2013 rulers had been forced from power in Tunisia Egypt Libya Yemen Bahrain and Syria although obviously an ongoing situation there also Algeria Iraq Jordan Kuwait and Sudan there's protests in Venezuela uh, in Caracas which started this year in February um, turned deadly when three people were shot by gunmen following a peaceful march that day there have been many uh, demonstrations since then varying in size from small gatherings to large rallies We've had the Maidan um, protests, uprising and revolution in Ukraine. Um, whether that's been successful is a matter of opinion. It doesn't look good at the moment, that's for sure. I think um, maybe some people who are involved in these protests and uprising have the right, the right um, sense of meaning and uh, they mean well, but then sometimes other people come along and start infiltrating TV program Homeland. Barack Obama defended his decision to free uh, five senior Taliban leaders to secure the release of Sergeant Bogdal. Barack Obama has also condemned Russian aggression in Ukraine, saying it was uh, dark, using dark um, tactics, basically. Um, he said, how can we allow the dark tactics of the 20th century to define the 21st? It's just quite strange when he says stuff like that when, you know, he's obviously involved in allowing the NSA spying to go on and on, on the whole population of the world, basically. So, uh, you know, he's one to talk about dark tactics. Basically, Obama met uh, President Petro Poroshenko of Russian chocolate fame and uh, pledged support for him and uh, offered uh, five million dollars of military assistance to Kiev. I mean, it's obviously they're gearing up again for a war I'm going to Ukraine in next uh, next week um, hoping that things will be safe there at least 
Um, obviously not safe in eastern Ukraine. I'm going to be more in sort of south um, Ukraine. Obama has also pledged night goggles, food, clothes, rations, radios and other equipment. And Obama is now in Brussels for a meeting of the G7 industrial nations. Uh, obviously the G8 has changed now as Russia has been removed. Today's episode is mostly about protests, unrest and uprisings and um, police in Nigeria's capital have banned all protests planned in support of the more than 200 girls kidnapped in April. Um, other protests, Indian police have fired water cannons to disperse hundreds of protesters in Uttar Pradesh where two, te two teenage cousins were gang raped and hanged. Protesters, many of whom were women, were demonstrating outside the office of State Chief Minister Akhilesh Yadav. Turkish Prime Minister Erdogan called CNN correspondent Ivan Watson an agent working for uh, foreign governments. Istanbul police uh, had interrupted a live CNN broadcast on Saturday and briefly held Watson, uh, who's been a Istanbul correspondent for some time. He was reporting on the first anniversary of Turkey's biggest anti-government protests in decades at the Gezi Park area and we'll be going to Antony later on in today's broadcast. This week's news, riot police were on standby as tens of thousands took to the streets in Madrid, Barcelona and other cities across Spain on Monday to demand a vote on whether to rid Spain of its royal family. Yeah, I wonder if we could do that here as well. This comes after Spain's King Juan Carlos um, has said that he's going to abdicate and um, promoting his son Philippe as the new king. Prince Philippe and would presumably take the title King Philippe the fourth. Far left parties have called for a national referendum to abolish Spain's monarchy. Sudanese authorities are to free a woman who was sentenced to death for having abandoned the Islamic faith which is um, uh, punishable by death in most Islamic traditions. If you decide later on you don't want to be a Muslim, uh, you can be executed. And this has been condemned by um, some other world leaders, including the UK's Prime Minister Cameron. Police at Heathrow Airport arrested a 19-year-old man suspected of terror offences. He was detained by counter-terror SO15 officers on suspicion of preparing for acts of terrorism. And they said it was Syria related. I wonder whether he was one of the rebels because that would be a bit strange because they were, our government was actively supporting the rebels up until a few months ago at least. Um, police can now just arrest people and say it's because of terrorism. Uh, even in this case they've admitted this is not in response to any immediate risk or threat. I would have thought that was the point of these terrorism laws, some immediate uh, risk or threat. Also this week a Bilderberg uh, meeting occurred in Copenhagen. Copenhagen, Denmark. It's been a year since the last one, which is in Watford, England, which I attended. I met uh, some interesting people there, Alex Jones and David Icke amongst them. And there was quite a few hundred people there, going into the thousands actually. Um, there was a lot of people not let in. The police stopped people coming in and we were we were held in a field which was in view of where the Bilderberg conference was going on. Uh, it was a great atmosphere and there was lots of speakers. This year apparently there was a lot less people. Um, it was in a more isolated part of um, Copenhagen. Copenhagen in Denmark and just less people were able to make it there. But I know that Alex Jones and um, David Icke were also reporting on that, that uh, conference there. Who are the 